Today we are here to, uh, to talk about cloud native DevOps, GitOps, or whatever else come up with Steve uh, Wade uh, from Metal Financial Institution. And Steve is head of the platform in Metal. And um, I am Penny Resnick. I'm CRO at Container Solutions. And we, again, I encourage you to, to speak up or, or share the questions in the chat. I will put the chat on the side. So far, nothing, which is fine. Um, yeah, so welcome, Steve. And uh, really good to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. It's going to be an interesting chat. Uh, yeah, if anyone disagrees and has opinions on what we're talking about, feel free to to raise those. It's a like Penny said, it's a it's an open forum for everybody to engage and get stuff out of this. So it's not just listening to me talk. Good. So we have a bit of structure here for the conversation, but again, it will take us in all kind of different places. And like Steve told us just before we started, challenges are good. If you want to challenge Steve he welcomes it so um but before we go into more details first do you want to introduce yourself uh uh better at you and metal and uh sure so i'm uh, i'm steve wade and as penny said head of platform engineering at, at metal so for those of you who don't know uh metal is a is a venture proposition um stood up inside natwest and NatWest, for those of you who also don't know, is a kind of um, in incumbent bank or think of kind of bricks and mortar. You go into branches uh, and you, you know, you make transactions, et cetera, and you, you interface with a human, essentially. Um, and Meta was kind of spun up to provide digital business banking um, to end up, uh, independent retailers and kind of sm uh, small to medium, large um, enterprises. So the reason why it was spun up is because... Um, <coughs> The, the kind of thought leaders essentially inside of NatWest um, wanted to see a new way of doing things. Um, and that has come with a, a set of advantages, um, but it's also come with a few disadvantages as well. And we're gonna kind of uh, tease those out in the next kind of hour. Very good. So I already have some questions about that, but I'll keep them for later. So um, yeah, basically, what were the challenges? What exactly the problems you were dealing for with uh, in the beginning that the leaders of, uh, of the company decided that all these changes required? Sure. So I think it's important to kind of uh, go back to the past before we talk about the present, right? So they they struggled to release features to customers, essentially. They had too much red tape, too much, you know, compliance and regulatory requirements, Um you know, changes had to go to a change approval board. That approval board met every two weeks. If I want to make a one-line code change, I have to wait at least two weeks to release it. All right, and there's there's a number of things like that that and challenges that they had um, that essentially was one of the drivers behind um, spinning up a new a new venture. But as well as that, from from our standpoint, so if we just look at Metal in the past, um, so before I joined. Um, the the platform that was there was built for a purpose and that purpose was um what we called um the dog fooding stage so the dog fooding stage was essentially us being able to show natwest that we could build a digital bank in a set period of time we would create a new card the card would uh be put into the machine you would enter your pin and then back to your handset would come you know, the fact that you'd made a purchase and the purchase was a said location with said amount of money. Um, that was the first stage. And I was kind of bought in just at the end of the dog fooding stage when we needed to start to think more about, okay, how is this thing going to scale? And th that's where the important kind of um, challenges come, obviously, as, as probably a lot of you are already aware. Um, and as well as that, if we go back to the disadvantages of, of being inside of a larger organization or a larger bank, you could imagine that the microscope is going to be out on this, you know, this new venture. Okay. Well, you don't, you don't have to comply to all these regulatory requirements and you don't have to have these cab boards and how comes you can make, you know, changes to production every day. Like that, do you not, are you not worried? Do you know, what's your kind of sign off procedure, et cetera, et cetera. And then because of that, 
we were interfacing with the bank on a regular cadence, right? They came to our show and tells uh, that we had every, every sprint and they started to ask a lot of questions. Naturally, they were inquisitive, but they also had a little bit of envy, I would assume. Um, so one of the questions that they asked, and I've kind of talked about this before, is this unanswerable question. And the, uh, the question that they asked was, okay, well, Steve, as, you know, as head of platform engineering, how long would it take you to rebuild your whole entire environment in an incident, right, if you had a major outage? And I kind of just like shrugged my shoulders and said, well, actually, to be honest with you, I don't really know. Um, and the reason behind that is because we never needed to. So to kind of explain the implementation, running in the cloud in Amazon, Kubernetes cluster running on top, uh, application developers and platform engineers deploy workloads onto Kubernetes and Kubernetes is a desired state right so you know it's going to try and keep itself in a position you know that you've declared it in so why would I want to rebuild the whole entire cluster I don't really need to do that I'll just spin up a couple of new new machines they will join the cluster and everybody will move on but we had to start to prove certain things back to the wider bank to get more venture, to get more capital, to be able to do more things and provide more um, value to our, to our customer base. So we had to be able to answer this unanswerable question. And I think that's where, you know, things like GitOps and other things that we're going to talk about um, in the next kind of hour or so is going to kind of come to the fore there. That's going to help us be able to answer that question. So, you know, in this stage, when when I speak to people about same topics, they they typically ask, "Is like, why do I need all this?" Right? You you know, we're talking about these advanced technologies, and and I understand that the banks, you know, they want to be cool and everything, and uh, and all these new challenger banks coming in. But is it really needed? So, so I think the answer to that is is it it depends, right? That's the classic consultant answer, um, but really it's about for us specifically it's a couple of things right it's as a financial institution we're going to be audited so how easily can we show an audit trail of all the changes that have been made to all environments in an easy and cohesive manner the last thing that we want to do is have to go and create a spreadsheet manually like no one wants to be doing that um, and the other thing is for us to differentiate ourselves um, from our competitors is how quickly we can ship new features to our customers so the easier that we make the ability to be able to make changes to features or add new microservices, et cetera, et cetera, the more innovative our development, development team and engineering team can be. And you know, we've got a good split there. So platform team can be responsible for maintaining the resiliency of the platform, observability, logging, et cetera, et cetera. And then the developers are focusing on the thing that they really wanna be focusing on, which is bringing value to our customers. They, they don't want to, or shouldn't need to become Kubernetes experts and understand, you know, the difference between a replica set and a deployment, right? Not all of them need to do that. There'll be a couple of them that will want to do that because they're inquisitive. Um, but if we get the abstraction right, and I think that's important as well, um, they can focus on the things that really matter to them. Yes, sounds good. So um, then you keep working with a larger bank and you were, essentially independent or how deeply integrated were you with, uh, with the original, uh, original? So, you, so yeah. metal being, uh, kind of standalone from, uh, NatWest. Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. So we were completely standalone. So we, in Amazon, we had our own Amazon organization. We had our own Amazon accounts. Um, but obviously if we keep coming back to that microscope, the questions kept coming. Right. And we had to keep we were essentially playing ping pong with them. They would ask a question. We bat the we, we bat them back a response. Um, so we're not that tightly coupled with them. Um, they obviously, you know, pay the bills, essentially. Uh, they pay the Amazon bills and they pay our bills. Um, so as long as we can conform and answer their questions, they kind of let us get on with it um, for the for the most part. And I think a good example of that is. Um, the work that we have done in terms of infrastructure automation that they had a team that was there working on uh, infrastructure autom automation for a very specific component of Amazon, which was their account creation. And I think the team had been there for something like four or five months and hadn't really delivered a lot. 
and we videoed standing up a, a whole new environment from the account creation all the way up to the fully working platform and actually showed them what we could do. And now the kind of conversation has turned the other way around. So it's more, can Metal come to NatWest and have conversations about how we should be doing things rather than why are you doing it like this? Does it really work? So that was exactly the next question is, did you have plans to actually influence the mother organization uh, or this is just a side effect? So, so I, th I think to answer your question, yeah, we did. So the whole venture or the whole of Metal was stood up to be able to show NatWest that there is a different way of doing things. And yeah, we have, we have customers, we have a proposition, you know, but essentially how much of the ways of workings that we have inside Metal can they take back and implement at NatWest? Obviously they are running at a much, much larger scale than we are, um, but they now have some Kubernetes clusters, they're now deploying workloads, you know, like the, it's, it's starting to happen now, which is, which is a great thing to see for me personally, the, the kind of work that we've been doing is now being kind of distributed and dissipated into the, into the wider um, bank there. I think we've got a couple of questions coming in. So, yes. So I, I actually, I, I did see them, but I was holding back a bit because okay. they probably no will be more relevant a bit later, at least the first one. Um, let's do the second one. Um, uh, is it decoupled from banks, traditional backend systems, and even uh, the main thread? Is it decoupled from the banks, traditional backend systems? Actually, okay, so is what you are building decoupled from traditional backend systems of the mother bank? Uh, yes, we, ha we have no dependency on NatWest at all. Um, we're completely decoupled. Um, we, we did that for probably obvious reasons. Um, innovation speed is, is one of them. Um, and for us to be able to truly show them a new way of working, we'll, we'll go, we wanted to go all in and do everything. Um, so we've partnered with a third party provider that is essentially um, holds, the, holds the money and the funds. Um, and what we are doing is building an integration into that um, bank and kind of performing the transactions and providing a, a mobile first approach, essentially. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the split. Yep. So to follow up on this is uh, from talking to other similar initiatives or, or new banks, what they, what they found is that they still need to integrate with all, all these old systems, whatever they do, they cannot escape and they have this like uh, an old black box server in the basement, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that, everything else in the cloud, but that one thing, it's just impossible to remove. Do you have things like that too that have to do with that? No, we're lucky enough where everything that we run is in the cloud. So to go kind of back a little bit, when we re-platform, so we talk about uh, Metal Platform V1 and Platform V2, and Platform V1 was the dog fooding phase, and Platform V2 is what we're currently running on now. So when we started Platform V2, the first thing we did as a team um, as a platform team is set down a set of principles that we would we would derive and we would not break and if we had to break them then we had to all come together and form consensus on you know breaking them and that was an exemption to the principle that would be written down and the engineering team have gone and done the same kind of thing and one of the main principles is that we will be we will be cloud first and but we will not wed ourselves to a specific cloud provider and the reason why we have to do that is because if you go back to, to NatWest, they also have to show, you know, they have other things running in other clouds, but they also have to show how easily they could move and leverage another cloud if, if they really needed to. Um, and luckily with Kubernetes as the abstraction layer, that starts to become a little bit more easier. Um, you know, we just have to stand up the infrastructure in another cloud essentially. And then, or use a managed, uh, or use a managed service. Um, think of like GKE or something like that. But the way that we deploy workloads is exactly the same, which is the great thing really about Kubernetes. It, it provides that abstraction layer above the infrastructure. That's a perfect. Next question, and this, uh, can you describe a bit what is your technical setup and uh, where, how you actually get into the where you want to be? Sure. So um, obviously we're running, we're running AWS. Um, so 
We don't use um, EKS. We don't use the managed Kubernetes service. Um, main reasons behind that is because our definition of what we mean by vanilla cluster is a little bit different from what they deem as a vanilla cluster. And we can kind of come onto that a little bit later when we start to dig into the GitOps uh, pattern and paradigms a little bit more. Um, and then on top of that, we obviously have the, the Kubernetes cluster. And then on top of that, we have a number of microservices. And the backend uh, microservices are written in, in Java. And then we have a number of Node.js apps um, for our um, internal tools team, or, or sorry, our customer operations team. And then we have uh, you know, an, a number of others that I can't talk about, but Node and, Node and Java essentially is the, is the workloads that we deploy on top of that. And then we obviously have from a platform side, um, we, we write everything in Go. So there's a number of Go microservices that sit there and do platform level things. So like utilities and stuff like that. Okay, so I heard a lot of the, the GitOps same. So uh, I assume you have an opinion on that and, uh, and uh, you're using these principles. Can you? Yeah. So yeah, we are, we are, heavy, we are heavy users of GitOps. Uh, we get, we get ops everything, uh, literally. Um, so a couple of reasons, really, if, if we kind of roll back the clock a bit and ask the question of why we did GitOps, I think that's kind of an important one as well. Um, so before we, you know, the clusters were kind of apples versus oranges in dog food. Like it was just get something out there rough and ready and, you know, prove, to, to NatWest that we could, we could, you know, create a bank and it would, you know, you'd be able to transact and you get something back on your mobile phone. And we, and we did that. Um, but what ended up happening is the platform team became a burden to the, to developer innovation. Um, main reasons behind that were because we were so focused or the platform team at the time was so focused on kind of the stability of the platform because it was, it was unstable. It was just quick and dirty to get it out there that a lot of the burden in terms of how do the microservices get deployed were over with the engineers. So they were creating their own Helm charts. As you can imagine, developers love to copy and paste. I was a developer in the past, so I know that that's true. Um, but they don't necessarily copy and paste the right things. Um, they just copy and paste them because they want to deploy to production. Um, so there was a lot of differences and inconsistencies in the way that they were deploying. And with inconsistencies comes incidents. And we couldn't have incidents if we're trying to show NatWest a new way of working, right? We've got to reduce incidents and increase innovation. They're the two things that we really need to show them. So in terms of GitOps, GitOps allowed us to be able to do a number of things, right? So if you think about it, developers were responsible for both CI and CD. But I think the important thing there is that when you actually see CI, CD, there's this slash in the middle between CI and CD. So what we did is we broke the two of them apart and we said, okay, you as engineers focus on the things that are important to you. Focus on application development and, pack and packaging up your microservice. So they, they are gonna get up to and including packaging their microservice in a Docker container. At the same time that we did that, we worked on this concept of a backend chart. So we have now one Helm chart that has all of the, you know, the best practices. We've got Kubernetes experts essentially um, and that is now the interface that they need. So for any of you that are not familiar with how Helm charts work, essentially a package manager, it's a templatized way of you being able to templatize um, certain resources that you want to deploy to Kubernetes. So we created the backend chart. They continue to work on building uh, Docker containers. And then now we have this thing called um, a Helm release. And a Helm release is another um, resource that gets deployed into Kubernetes. And all they're doing now is they're filling in the values file with the correct variables for their workload. And they are the best people to do that because they know how their workload runs. So we started this, this journey by really GitOpsifying, if you want to call it that word, um, platform level workloads. So I didn't want to go anywhere near the application developers. Let them deploy the way they're deploying currently and let us learn all the lessons of how GitOps really works cut ourselves a number of times, make a number of mistakes, um, but get into a position whereby we as a platform team were confident to bring all the engineers into a meeting room 
uh, on a per mission team basis and sit them down and say, look, I'm gonna, we're gonna show you this thing working, right? Here's all the way that you used to do it and now here's the new way. And you don't have to worry about X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, the way that we deploy is gonna be handled, handled for you. You're gonna be focusing on CI and that's the important thing. They wanna ship features that are stable and we will take some of the burden away from them with regards to delivery. So we did this, you know, we iterated a number of times and we got all of the platform workloads Gitopsified in inverted commas. And then we went along the journey of taking each product team and Gitopsifying, I'm gonna use this term constantly, um, their microservices for their um, product teams. And then what we did is we said, okay, well, we'll help you do that, but as a way for you to give back, what we want you to do is document the process. And what that does is it forces them to learn, right? If, if I take their Helm chart and just deploy it, they're not gonna get how it works behind the scenes. What I wanted to do is make sure that they documented how, how this whole process works so that when new engineers join the team, they have the documentation that explains to them how they onboard new microservices. So we did this a couple of times, we got it working in a, in a sandbox environment, and then we rolled these changes through to production. And now we have this kind of self-service model, right? So developers no longer need to come to the platform team to deploy their workloads. There's obviously some guardrails inside Kubernetes so that you can't do things, you know, something silly like put 300 replicas rather than three. Um, you know, we've got some kind of guardrails so you can't do things like that. Um, but essentially now, we're no longer the burden on the platform, um, on the developers, and they are, they have the ability to be able to deploy um, applications and new features as much as they want. And what we get out of the back of that is simplification of pipelines. So them for, for them to be able to deploy their workloads, it's very simple. They create a new image, they upload the image. Flux, if you don't know how Flux works, Flux is an agent inside Kubernetes uh, inside the cluster and kind of does this bi-directional sync. So it syncs from Git and writes back to Git when it's made changes. And then it also syncs to the image repository. So we have this three letter environment prefix. So every image that gets built for any of your microservices, the tag is the environment prefix dash the long commit SHA. So think dev dash commit SHA that gets, that gets um, pushed to the image registry, Flux sees it, pulls down the new image version, deploys it, and then writes back the fact that it's upgraded back to Git, right? And because we have this environment prefix that's in all of our environments, and we now have a nice templatized way of being able to deploy, even adding a new microservice to the CI kind of um, machine or the, the platform is trivial because as long as I set the application name, the rest is going to be handled for them. They're always going to have dev dash. The commit is an easy thing to pull out um, of, your, of Git. So that's trivial. And now they're focusing on the thing that's really important, which is, which is the CI. So we now have an auditable um, history of all the changes. However, it, it gets a little bit better than that. So now we've got an auditable history of all the changes. So from an auditor perspective, we can answer the question, when were changes made to the environment, who made them when? We've got that in something that developers and engineers understand, which is Git. But the great thing is, if we come back to the unanswerable question of how long would it take you to, um, to rebuild? So now, as long as we stand up a Kubernetes cluster with Flux and point it at the right repository, we know that Flux is gonna reconcile and it's gonna reconcile the state that it had the last time. So now what we do is every night, we tear down the, the environments, obviously not production, because that wouldn't be a great idea for our customers. But in, in environments that are used for the development lifecycle, we tear them down every night, or we essentially scale them down to zero. Um, and then at nine o'clock, and then at 8 a.m. the following morning, they automatically turn back on again, flux reconciles, and we're back to where we were. So 9.25, we are back with a fully fully working dev environment, fully working stage environment. So we're kind of- On a platform level, right? Not, not the application level. Uh, not the, 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 well, the application doesn't run if the platform's obviously not 
online. Yeah. So essentially we are saving money because we are scaling down infrastructure out yeah. of hours and we're not making Bezos like a trillionaire rather than a billionaire. Um, and we are kind of constantly dog fooding the fact that we can rebuild, right? Because we're, we're kind of semi doing it on a, on a daily cadence. Um, so we can answer the unanswerable question, which is great from a kind of microscope, uh, you know, what are you doing at metal perspective? We get the audit, audit, auditability. We get the easy self-service uh, use of the platform from a developer perspective. Um, and then we have hooked GitOps into an already existing way of working for the developers, right? What I didn't want to do is completely change the way that they use everything, right? I don't want to do that. I want to take the pipelines that they currently have, simplify them and kind of embed GitOps in there in a way that they understand. Yeah. So from that now, we have the ability for developers, we have a number of different fluxes, but we can come onto that later. Um, we have the ability for developers to pretty much do whatever they want with the cluster to add business value to our, to our customer base um, without having to interface with the platform team. So the kind of split is, is there. We use that Helm chart as the abstraction and as a kind of interface. And then if they have any questions or we need to make changes, then we make changes to that backend chart. And that's the way that, you know, new features can be shipped essentially. So this, the split is quite nice. We still do have a platform team and we do have an engineering team. We don't have this kind of blend, like these kind of totally cross-functional teams. Um, but right now, I don't think we need that. Um, it, it's working very, very well. So <clears throat> kind of, if we look at the last month, um, brand new project was started. They have 15 new microservices deployed to production. I literally didn't even hear a peep from them until they told me that they needed a new, a new namespace. And we created the new namespace and away they go, they're at the races. And to me, that is exactly what we should be doing. We should be providing them a platform that they can innovate on. Don't, so, we don't wanna be the blocker to them. There are still external dependencies. For example, uh, the cloud uh, outages or anything else, but also from platform towards engineering. And um, since you don't have the cross-functional teams or and you do have dependencies, how would you, would that affect the, the overall sales of the entire process? So developers slash engineers um, are, have the ability to make infrastructure level changes if they want to. Um, so we have essentially um, Terraform modules. Um, we are lucky enough that the architecture of, of Metal is, um, is pretty standardized in the way that it works. So we're heavy users of Kafka. So you're either a subscriber or a producer of messages onto or off of Kafka. Um, but there are some other um, infrastructure pieces that you may need. Think S3 buckets um, is a kind of primary one that, that they need. So we have created a module in Terraform called application S3. It does all of the IAM roles, it encrypts the bucket. It does all the things that they as engineers don't wanna think about and neither should they have to but they understand the interface, which is that module. And it's got three or four things um, that they need to think about. Um, the main one really being um, the, the name of the application or the name of the microservice. They add that to um, the repository. So we have a modules repo that contains all the modules. And then we have other repositories that we call kind of quote unquote Terraform roots. And as an example, we have a product called Eevee so there is a Terraform root called Terraform Data EV, and that contains all of the kind of uh, kind of S3 buckets, RDS databases, S3 um, Elastic Searches, etc. They um, they commit their changes to there. We review them because infrastructure is kind of a platform level thing. Um, so we are code owners on that repository. We have to approve it. We approve it. It gets uh, executed. They have the S3 bucket. They have the IAM permissions it's all very consistent and standardized and then they continue working so they can make changes across the whole stack we just use this concept of code owners in github to um to know who is responsible for allowing them to get through the gate if that makes sense yeah so of course there's a perfect follow-up questions question from rafael is uh you know you, you talk about this uh 
readiness for audit and uh, an ability to change everything, how that fits in regulation, security, and generally this high level of uh, uh, audit trails and security in financial industry. Yeah, so obviously we, you know, we have a set of compliance and regulatory requirements that we will eventually uh, have to get to. So a key thing to note here is that metal isn't a bank, right? We don't hold the funds. The funds are held somewhere else. We are essentially an abstraction or a, a view on top of what is happening in, in the ledger or where the funds are held. So we don't come, uh, we don't have such strict compliance and regulatory requirements uh, as the main bank does because we're not really a bank, right? That, that's an important thing to note. Metal is not a bank. However, we do have compliance and regulatory requirements that we have from the main bank Right, they have a they have a list. If you are a bank, you have a massive list. If you aren't a bank, you have a slightly smaller list. And we have kind of codified these compliance rules inside a number of different mechanisms. So, um, think about when you onboard new microservices inside your pipeline. Obvious things such as you know making sure you've got no CVEs inside your container, make sure your container is not running as root. Like the the kind of quick wins essentially pipeline stops if you're doing anything like that and then if you get past that then how do when it comes to onboarding a new microservice we using this helm release as the abstraction right so now what we do is we have a set of compliance tests that run against the helm release so um, for any of you who are not familiar with the term open policy agent um, or, or conf tests essentially what this allows you to be able to do is define what's called rego policies um, and those policies uh, you set at either a warn level or a deny. So we have a very um, large amount of rego policies or quote unquote compliance tests at the Kubernetes layer level um, that have to be passed. And even, you know, an admin in GitHub like myself, I can't force the merge. Th these have to pass. So those pass, we have a, you know, that's our kind of um, compliance check to get inside the cluster or on board the microservice um, from a PR perspective. And then inside the cluster, there sits another gate, which is also doing another set of compliance tests, just in case you manage to somehow bypass the ones in the PR process. And we can reject applications or microservices that get deployed right at the front door of Kubernetes. So when it gets to the API, we run a set of checks. If you don't conform to our compliance requirements, you go back to where you were, which is rejection, because you have to go and uh, complete it again. So our compliance checks are are codified, and we can show we've showed NatWest how they are codified. We run you know a bunch of tests every time we make a change. Um, you know some of them do take a long time, um, but we we're ticking. We're ticking boxes essentially right so when that microscope is out they're asking a question and what we don't want to do is tick the tick box once and then just be like oh well they're never going to come back and ask us that again so we'll just continue doing what we wanted to do before um so we are very specific in okay well if you ask us a question we'll implement it in code and we will run it constantly because you're going to it's almost guaranteed that in three months time or one month's time or a year's time you're going to come back and say you remember that thing that i asked you in like February, can you prove to me that you're still doing it? Right, because that's the natural, they're naturally risk averse, right? That's why they're kind of slow in terms of delivery. So if we can constantly keep proving that we're doing these things, uh, it just allows them to have more increased confidence in the way that we're working. So that connects well to basic question, how you ensure that you're continuously improving and uh, uh, what are you actually measuring? So we measure a couple of things. So I, I, I call this a vanity metric, um, but it is something that we do, um, we do look at. So we look at number of new releases to production um, on, a, on, a monthly, on a monthly cadence. To me, that is, that is a vanity metric, right? It's, it, it, it's a good thing to have, um, but it, if you release you know, 400 new versions to production and 30 of them break and you have 10 incidents, well, it's not great, but no one talks about that. They talk about the 400 releases that they did to production. Um, so we do that. And the reason why we do that is because again, that was one of the questions that comes 
from the bigger bank. You know, we had to prove that we can innovate fast. And the way that we can prove that is if we can plot the trend of new versions or new releases that are happening on a, gra on a nice pretty graph in Grafana, then they have a way of being able to visually see the fact that, you know, we're making changes. Um, and then as, as well as that, um, we, we also um, look at things like mean time to recovery. So it, the unanswerable question was a massive headache for me personally. I didn't feel comfortable with not being able to give them an answer. Um, and I said to the team, like, we have to go back to them and give them an answer. And I don't want to just say a number. I want to prove to them that this is a real, this is really possible. So we do that. We have this concept of, um, you know, tear down and stand up essentially. Um, so we, we now know that we can tear down any environment and stand it back up. And in around 25 to 27 minutes, we get a fully working um, platform that developers slash customers can use depend upon what environment it is. So it, for us, it's kind of the vanity metric of number of, um, number of changes made. Mean time to recovery is probably the, the biggest one really from a platform perspective. Um, and then f for me, probably personally, and maybe uh, a lot of the, the guys in the platform team is really, are we a burden to the, are we a burden to developers or are we an enabler to developers? And it, it's not a binary yes or no, it never is. But if it's on the side of an, if it's more on the side of enablers than a burden, we're doing the right thing. And I think, if we, we we've been tracking that we have um regular meetings um with the developers so or the engineers and they fill in a form <clears throat> it's essentially a questionnaire about the platform for that that month and then we track the numbers over time so what's the rating out of 10 how many people did it and then we track that over time and if we're going up or we plateau on a flat line then good if we go down then we then there's a problem and we have to address it so we're trying to stay between eight and nine. If we go below eight, the kind of innovation in the platform team kind of has to stop a tiny bit. And we start to ask ourselves a couple of questions and then we make changes. Sounds and good. then we try and get the next month back to that eight. Yeah. It sounds pretty good and pretty yeah, like uh, Valid is saying, it, everything seems to be quite ironed out. But what did you learn over this uh, uh, period and, and what keeps you still up at night? Uh, let, me, let me take the first one uh, first. So um, what, did, what did we learn? So we learned that things like Kubernetes force developers and operators to come closer together right? You can't, you can't have silos, right? They are using the system that you, that they are users of the platform, right? They, the engineers are our customers essentially. And our actual customers at Metal are the engineers customers really, if we kind of look at it like that. Um, so we had to bring them closer to us, right? And we had to, for, for us, and I think for, for me personally, right? The tech is the easiest part. It's always the people, that is the more challenging piece. So what we learned is that we made the right decision in learning GitOps inside our team in a kind of silo and learning how to do it, learning all the rough edges, coming up with a pattern. So what we talk about at, at Meta was this concept of patterns and principles. So we came up with a pattern that worked and then we had to bring each mission team in. So that collaboration started early. Um, and then <clears throat> we, we built a pattern that now works that they can continue with. What else we learned is you can't make wholesale changes because you like something and, and, and assume that they like it as well. Um, a prime example is we, we went to um, the, the platform team moved to customize. So for any of you who don't know how customize works, essentially, you have a base and then on top of that, you can patch it and you can essentially make changes. So what that did for us is massively dried up our repository because we had a large amount of stuff that sat in the base. And then for each environment, we just had environment differences. So a lot of the times it was just simply URLs. 
<clears throat> so we thought, okay, well, this is great. We've greatly reduced the number of files in our repo. So the developers are going to absolutely love this, right? So why don't we just create a brand new PR over there and move all of their stuff to customize? So we did that. And then we got the, I don't know how this works. It's ridiculously confusing. Like, you know, yeah, fair enough. You've, you've dried up our repository and you've moved like, you know, hundreds of files, but actually it's more confusing. So I think the important thing to note is just because it works for your team doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for another team. So now when we talk about owners, they are owners of their repositories. So if they don't want to use customize, they don't have to use customize, but it's important that they understand it. So I think that that's kind of the, the big lesson that we learn is just because it works for us doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody else. Um, and really, really focusing on the areas that need to be self-service. So what we've talked about right now is development workloads, right? How do we enable them to be able to, you know, deploy microservices into the environment? But there's other things as well that you need to think about from a GitOps perspective. So a, a, GitOps is not just about deployment. It's about using Git as the source of truth. So think about things like, how do you get alerts into Prometheus? How do you change the Prometheus configuration? So we have all that in a repository called monitoring resources. And now they can go there and add alerts and they get synced into the cluster or into Prometheus every 15 seconds. So they don't have to understand how all of the internals of Prometheus works, nor, nor should they need to. But they have this repository that they understand where they can add new alerts, they can add new Grafana dashboards and they all get synced in. So I think for us, it was as soon as we switched the mindset from a push model to a pull model, it really made us think about a lot of different things. What is the burden to developers? And that's always the question that we ask every time we start a new piece of work. How can we make the developers' lives easier? They are our customers. And I think that's the biggest thing for us. And that's the thing that personally I will take to, you know, the next jobs that I have in the future is if I am in the platform team, the developers and the engineers and my customers, I have to satisfy their needs. And it's going to be a collaborative effort to do that. And that but, sounds like uh, that's what keeps you up to, at night, unless you have other things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what keeps me up at night is that in, in the cloud native space, I mean, like, let's just not take GitOps, let's just take cloud native in general, right? It, it, it's so fast moving that no matter how fast you can move, you're always behind. So, you know, like a prime example is you, you deploy Prometheus at version 2.19 and 2.20.1 comes out and you're like, what? I've literally just turned around and it's a new version already. Um, so that, that kind of keeps us awake at night. Um, and I think apart, apart from that, that that's, that's probably it really. I think that we've got a, a platform that is kind of, I, I'm now going to jinx myself massively and say, uh, semi battle proof. Um, the other thing that we didn't talk about is that we have an, another environment called a bug bounty environment. And we actually have 50 hackers around the world that constantly try and hack us. Um, and they have actually found a lot of, you know, a lot of vulnerabilities and we've patched them. So by having those external people that, you know, have some kind of incentive to really be quite destructive, um, we are constantly improving. So the only thing that, that really keeps me up at night is the fact that I have to read another set of release notes. That's really the, the only thing, to be honest with you. And if we talk about Flux, we're running V1. They're already looking at V2 and V2 is completely different. So now how do we bring that new way of working in? I assume this is not significant change. It's just incremental improvements of uh, getting forward. But what's next? Like, Do you have a next big idea? Yeah, so the, the next big idea for us. So if we if we think about GitOps and what it's doing, right? It's It's reconciling state inside the cluster. Right, that's essentially what it's doing. It's desired state with Git as the back end. But the way that we upgrade Kubernetes is, a, is an interesting one that we currently have, right? So we have this concept of ephemeral clusters. We're not going to make changes. We're not going to patch the nodes and turn them from 117 to 118. That's not the way we want to do it. So currently how we upgrade right now is we tear down the cluster. We stand up a new one at 118. Flux does all of its fluxiness and all of the workloads come uh, back on and everything works but for that 
for that downtime and uptime. So if you think tear down 20 minutes, stand up 25, 30 minutes. So let's round that out to an hour. There is an hour in time where developers can't work. There is an hour in time where our customers have an outage, right? But we know that we can reconcile with Flux. So now how do we get cluster A or current cluster, cluster B, new cluster kind of next door, and then traffic shape customers, whether they are engineers or whether they are actual metal customers, across from old cluster to new cluster with minimal downtime because the, the concept of zero downtime i don't truly believe in i don't think it's tr like 100 percent possible um, because of things like dns so how do we do that but not breaking the gitops paradigm and that's the next thing that we want to work on so gitopsifying kubernetes upgrades essentially so, is the next big right one. so treating the platform the same way as as you treat the applications yep exactly okay so we have nine minutes remaining. So let, let's try to go over the questions that we didn't ask yet. Uh, so I think how public cloud outages affect your SLA? I sort of partially asked that question, but maybe you have explained. Yeah, so, our, so I think the important thing to note, right, is your SLA for your application is only as good as your SLA for your infrastructure. You can't better it. So our SLA is as good as the SLA that we get from Amazon, right? So. How does it affect it? Well, it's basically a one-to-one -one mapping. We can't get any better than the infrastructure that we run on. So, yeah, I think that's kind of that's kind of the answer to that question. Can we ask the second one? Um, yeah, the audit trail. You were you audited already? And if yes, how did they receive the new way? So we have been internally audited by members of NatWest. We haven't been externally audited by a kind of third party auditor. Um, so they, they liked it, right? They don't, we, you know, they can come in essentially at any point in time and we don't have to say, we don't have this like lead time. So can you please tell us two weeks before you want to come in and audit us so that we can get this nice massive Excel spreadsheet ready for you that you can read and then try and understand. Um, we just now say, well, you can come whenever you want and we'll get you a Git history of all the changes and then we can step through with, through them with you. So we just um, got them in a room, presented the screen and essentially went down the list and said, which, which, which day do you want? What time do you want? And we've got a number of different repositories. We showed them the repositories and they're the, they're the changes that get made. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're saying that the workloads and data does not rely on public cloud providers. So how do you abstract the cloud provider managed services? So the, the data is right. So the, the platform team is relatively small. So do I want, you know, we've got like four or five databases. Do I want ever, do I want someone that's responsible full time for, you know, patching and managing databases? No, I don't. I'll leave that to Amazon. Amazon can go and do that for us. Um, do I want someone else to do the same thing with Elasticsearch? No, I don't. Um, and I think it comes down to, you know, what is the core thing that your business is trying to achieve, right? For us in the platform team, it's not to maintain databases. It's again, to allow engineers to innovate. So yeah, we do use a couple of managed services inside the cloud provider that we, that we have, but there are, we're not using managed services that are not available in other clouds, right? We could go to managed Elasticsearch. We could go to, you know, another managed database provider if we needed to. What we don't use is things like lambdas because lambdas are specific in their implementation to Amazon, right? We could, if we wanted to run them in, in Kubernetes, but we don't really need to. Um, so the, the core workings of Metal is running in the Kubernetes cluster. And the, 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 the kind of data warehouse, if you want to call them that, I, we use managed services because we don't want to be maintaining those kind of things. We'll let someone else deal with that. Good. So the next one, somebody missed something due to hungry cut. So that's a good reason. Um, so what kind of metrics do you have for newly onboarded engineers and generally later on for uh, sort of value stream mapping delivery. Uh, how long does it take for Hotfix to get from here to there and 
things like yeah, that. Yeah, so, so 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 we have that, but again, um, from a from a platform perspective, that is not a metric that we internally care about. Like at a engineering level, yeah, we do care about that. So how quickly can we get it through? Is not something that I don't mind if it's you know necessarily if it's 20 minutes or 25 minutes and I want to try and trim it down to 17 minutes um, but because the pipelines flow and the way that they are templatized is generic we have a re we have a rough idea of how long it would take but the thing that we have to be cognizant of is the testing that happens on that discrete microservice and w what its severity and priority is in terms of our customers in our customers using it so if it's returning back your transactions that you've made, you know, for the last 30 days, the amount of testing that's done there, you can imagine is substantial because we don't want to be returning them back, you know, miscalculated information because that's a regulatory breach. Um, but there's other microservices that kind of flow through. So from a microservice perspective, they are, they do contract level testing. So consumer driven contracts and they have contract tests between all of their microservices. So in terms of integration level tests, they don't have a huge amount. Um, but again, for me personally, I'm probably the wrong person to talk about this. Um, I don't really, I don't really get involved in, in their kind of testing because that's the kind of engineering specific um, component. And in terms of um, success, so I think I've, I've kind of talked about this in a previous talk. Two, a couple of months ago, 218 deploys to production, 218 of them were successful, zero incidents. That, that, and that is enough to go back and show them that what we're doing, okay, it may, it may be confusing. It may be a little bit more difficult. It may be completely outside of your comfort zone, but what we're doing works. And now it's, okay, well, if you can do that, how do we do that? And that's where the shift has happened. Actually, you know, what would you recommend to other people in, before they actually get the support from their management team? How would you recommend them to go about it? So I, th I think if we, j I'm going to kind of narrow the scope of that question, if it's okay, and just specifically talk about GitOps as a kind of paradigm. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things that I would think about, right? And there's this misconception um, that, you know, I have to do it in office hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's public cloud providers that can run cube. You can run cube locally on your laptops. So what I would say is start really, really small, right? If, if you're not running Kubernetes at all, start spin up a Kubernetes cluster locally and start firing YAMLs at it. And if you don't understand them, it doesn't matter because it's all about the learning at that point. Then once you understand some of the concepts of Kubernetes, then try and deploy the workloads that you now understand in a GitOps fashion. So put them in a different repository deploy Flux into your cluster, point it at that repository, and then in syncs, you know, your, your changes. Then once you've got that, you've now got this demo, right, that you can take to people that are, you know, that will question you and say, why do you want to GitOpsify all this stuff? What's the point? And you can say, well, look, here's the real value. I'll tear down the cluster locally and I'll stand up a new one. And guess what? We get back to where we are. And then you just like kind of mic drop and then they are all flabbergasted that this thing is possible. Um, and then you hopefully get a, uh, a little mission team that starts up inside your organization where you start to really go all in on this stuff. So I think start really small, start with a, really th a thing that's really difficult. Don't start with necessarily something that is ridiculously easy. Um, think about changes. So think about what happens when a microservice version change, how do we automatically deploy that? Because that's, that's gonna be embraced by your developers because that's what they need to be able to do. And then build patterns and build principles, right? Build a pipeline pattern that everybody understands, right? I could draw it out on a whiteboard. I've, we've, got it in, we've got it in a wiki and document absolutely everything, right? Don't assume because you understand it that someone else is going to understand it. The amount of documentation that I've written is absolutely absurd. Um, but the fact that now engineers, new engineers that join the team have the ability to be able to deploy microservices to production with zero to no interaction with our team is, you know, is where we wanted to get to. So there would be my kind of things. Start small locally, document everything, 
think about simplification of patterns and principles. And then if you're still having problems, then reach out to Penny and us and we'll, we'll come and help. Uh, that, that's the perfect summary, I guess. And, uh, and uh, there, you get a lot of credits for GitOpsifying things. So, uh, and we are perfectly on time. It's exactly 12. So, uh, and we are out of questions. So it was real pleasure to have you here and, and have this conversation. And uh, I really hope you'll learn something. And uh, if you have questions, you can uh, you can ask them later. And we'll... Yeah, f feel free to reach out, right? We've, we've been on this 18 month to two year journey. We've got a pattern that works. And now I think the important thing is giving that pattern back to everybody else. Right. There's no point in us all trying to solve the same challenges. Let's solve ones that are, you know, unique to our to our business. So, yeah, Absolutely. feel free to reach out, and I'm happy to help. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for joining everyone. And uh, we have other two webinars coming in second and tenth of December. The first one with Jamie Dobson and uh, and Simon Wardley on strategy, and second one with Michael Muller and. Sorry, Patrick van der Blake from Gremlin on 10th of December, uh, September. So see you there and, uh, and thank you. Thanks everyone.